Hi. Wow, I'm really loud. I'm going to walk over here, because these people over here thought that they were going to avoid participating. That's why they sat over here. So I'm going to begin over here today. Um, I have no slides. <gasps> Gasp. So I'm going to talk to you for like 40 straight minutes. It's going to be like 30 minutes of live demo. But we're going to start with some interactivity, because it's the morning. And you all partied hard last night, and so we need to wake up. How many people have had their coffee? See, you're all participating. Great. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, I'm sorry, you're not going to make it through the day. So my name is Seth. Uh, I'm the director of technical advocacy at a company called HashiCorp. How many people have heard of HashiCorp before I gave you a sticker this morning? OK, cool. So we make a number of open source tools, Vagrant, Packer, Surf, Console, Terraform, Vault, and Nomad. Today I'm going to be talking to you about Vault. And I want to start off with a little informal survey, just so I can understand where everyone is. How many people here would consider themselves a startup employee? You work for a startup. OK. How many people here would consider themselves like a normal employee? You work for like a medium-sized company. OK. And how many people here would consider themselves an enterprise employee? You work for like a big old giant, and you have like networking ACLs on your laptop. Right. So I want to tell you a story. It's, um, it's, it's called the story of how you get a database credential. So if you work for a startup, um, and you need a, a login for your web app. Let's say you have a Rails app or a Django app, and you have to get credentials to that app so it can talk to a database. Let's say it's Postgres. So we have our Django app that needs to talk to Postgres. Really concrete example. If you're in a startup, how do you do that? Well, it's four simple steps. First, you Google, how do I create a Postgres user? <laughs> Second, you copy the text from the Stack Overflow post. That's the first result. Third, you SSH into the production machine. Four, you paste the command. Four very simple, straightforward steps. If you work for a medium-sized company, it's a little bit better than that, right? You have a wiki page. Uh, and on that wiki page, there are instructions. So you don't Google. You copy from the wiki page. You probably have to ask someone else, but you just like DM them on Slack or HipChat. You're like, yo, need a Postgres username and password. They're like, sure, and they DM it back to you. We're not going to talk about security at all there. Then, if you work for an enterprise, right? If you work for an enterprise, you submit this thing called a JIRA ticket. <laughs> because you have these things called DBAs. And those DBAs create those database passwords for you. So you submit your JIRA ticket. You wait anywhere from six to eight hours. And by hours, I mean weeks. And you get you know, the database credentials emailed back to you in plain text. <clears throat> You then put those database credentials in some config file, like a JSON file or a YAML file, and you probably check it into source control, and you don't think about it anymore. If you work for one of those large enterprises, though, because that, that process is so painful and so time consuming, you might just keep those credentials in your back pocket, too. Because you never know when you might need to access the prod database unauthenticated, so you just keep those around. And over time, we develop secret sprawl where whether you're a small startup or a large enterprise, there are all of these credentials sitting around. And I'm not just talking about things like database credentials at this point. I'm talking about things like AWS IAM access keys. If you're a startup, you just go in the GUI and you clicky clicky and you make some access keys and then you, know, you leak them and you get Bitcoin mined and you owe Amazon like $30 billion and then you're like, can I even revoke this credential? I have no idea because I don't know what it's being used for. Uh, I don't know if this is some individual developer's IAM credential or if this is particular to some service that's critical in production. And the same is true for Postgres, right? If you're, oh, I'm going to make a reference, and I don't know if it's going to make sense here. Um, if you're a company like Ashley Madison, OK. <laughs> if you're a company like Ashley Madison and you've detected through anomaly detection or logging or Twitter that your <laughs> database is hacked, how do you stop the hemorrhaging? How do you prevent like, further data from leaking? Can you safely revoke that credential without taking down production? Do you know? Uh, and this is really the, the key essence of the problem. There's four key problems in the state of secret management right now. The first is secret sprawl. We have secrets everywhere. I'm going to ask you this, and make sure your boss is not in the room before you answer. How many people have a production credential on their laptop right now? OK, the rest of you are lying or don't know. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. How many people use GitHub or Bitbucket or a similar service? 
and you have an SSH key on your laptop. And whether or not that SSH key is password protected, guess what? That SSH key has the ability to access code that runs in production. So you do have a production credential on your laptop. It's very likely. You just don't think about it that way. So the first is secrets brawl. We have these secrets everywhere. The second is a lack of a centralized source for secrets. How do you generate a Postgres credential? Where you go into the Postgres database, you run some SQL commands, you get a user back. How do you generate an AWS IAM credential? Where you go in a GUI, you clicky clicky, or you run some AWS CLI commands. How do you generate a Cassandra user? Right? You either go in the GUI or you run a bunch of Java commands to generate it, or Groovy to generate it. So there's no central source for secrets. And the result is that it's really hard to build automation around that. I don't have an easy way to be like, give me a Cassandra login. Give me a console login. Give me new IAM credentials. And that's because sometimes you have to run some stuff on a CLI, and sometimes you have to make an API call, and sometimes you have to physically type things into a web UI in order to get a result back. The third problem is the lack of what's called a break glass procedure. And this goes back to the Ashley Madison situation, which is even if we had a centralized source for secrets and we could solve the secret sprawl problem, how on earth would we handle a data breach? How would we deal with a situation where we think our account credentials have been leaked? How can we revoke them safely without taking down all of the other services? How can we uh, segregate or uh, limit the downtime to only those affected services? Um, and how can we revoke a particular user? Whether that user has gone rogue or is just no longer an employee and left on graceful terms, none of the credentials he or she created should be valid moving forward. So if I go and I create a Postgres user, and two years from now I leave the company, how many people know to revoke that Postgres user? Right? I am willing to bet that if you have ever worked for a startup, there are still credentials that you created that are running on that startup's production server somewhere, whether or not you work there or not. So those are three. Um, the fourth problem is like access. Uh, and by access, I mean programmatic and operator access. And this is where Vault, and I'll talk a little bit more about Vault in a bit, and this is where Vault is really different than other secret management solutions. There are two things in the world that need secrets. The first is humans. How many people here are humans? <laughs> Perfect. And how many people here would consider themselves androids or, or machines? OK. Um, so there, there's two separate classifications of, of things that need access to secrets. As a human, a developer, an operator, a sysadmin, a devop, whatever your job title wants to be, um, you need access to secrets, right? You might need an API key in development. You might need IAM credentials so you can access the staging environment. You might need read-only database credentials so that you can run a query or do some analytics. As an app or a code or a machine or a node or a computer or whatever you want to call it, as a, a thing that processes bits of information, you also need credentials. You need to talk to the database. If you're a web application, you need to get data from the database. If you're uh, an accounting application, you need to be able to crunch numbers. You need to be able to access you know, maybe things on S3 so you can download things and process reports and upload things and generate PDFs. Right? You need credentials. And there's a little bit of overlap, but fundamentally, they're different. The way a machine, like a computer, gets a credential and uses it is fundamentally different than how you as a human get a credential and use it. You as a human like get a credential, you put it in one password or last pass, and then you kind of use it on the fly. Computers, they can acquire things programmatically. And this is why I talk about programmatic and operator access. So Vault is API driven, which means it provides a way for machines to get their own credentials. One of the biggest problems with the earlier example I talked about, where how do you get a database password, is the number of people who know that database password. So whether you're the startup or the mid-sized company or the enterprise, there are two people who know that database password. Right? The DBA who created it and the person who put it in the config file. And then anyone else who sees that config file. But at least two people know that database credential. So if you see in your anomaly detection that that database credential is doing something rogue, there's no way that you can actually figure out who is using it. It could be a rogue employee. It could be the application misbehaving. It could be an attacker. But you simply don't know. You don't have a single source of truth. There is no one-to-one -one mapping between a credential and the thing using it, whether that thing is a human or whether that thing is a machine. So I'm going to put this back in here. It's going to make a noise. Sorry. I told you. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to do this, uh, this live demo style. 
right? Who likes live demos? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to work, I promise. Um, <laughs> so, all right, so let me, let, me, let me jump over to, see it's starting off really great. I'm typing, can you tell? Um, it's all good. That's not the right one. That's the right one. Hi. All right, we're, we're gonna switch back to Wi-Fi. It worked like five minutes ago. <laughs> oh, wait, I can ping Google. Okay, we're getting there. The what? I'm on the hotel Wi Fi. Well, it, it worked. It worked this morning. Of course, it worked this morning. Let's see. It's fine. It's like they intentionally broke it just for my demo. Because I've I've done this, I've watched I've run through this like six times for my room and it's worked every single time. I can LTE my phone if They're recording this too, so there's a history of me screwing this up just for all of you to be able to relive that in the future. <laughs> oh, we can try one more thing. Maybe it's asking me to like do the thing again. I got it. I got it. We're just cheating and we're using this technology called VPN. Um, so we're in now. Hi. Okay. Sorry for the brief interruption. Back to jokes and fun things in the morning. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Vault. So how many people here are using Vault? Perfect. One. That guy is going to answer all my questions. Um, so <laughs> if you have any questions for me, just see him. Raise your hand again. Thank, thanks. <laughs> just kidding. I'll answer all of your Vault questions. How many people have heard of Vault? Okay. And you've said to yourself, I really need to use that thing. And how many people have no idea what I'm talking about and you thought this was about bank vaults? <laughs> okay, perfect. One person. He raised his hand and thought I didn't see. All right, so I want, to, I want to get started by talking a little bit about Vault's architecture. So Vault is a secret management solution. And there are other secret management solutions out there. Uh, some of them cost you know, $250,000 a year. Some of them cost $1.5 million a year. Um, but they're designed to provide a single source of truth for secrets in the environment. And Vault is an API-driven secret management tool. So what that means is that any and all secrets are acquired through an API. In fact, there's actually no way to interact with Vault that isn't via the API. So I'm gonna use some CLI commands here today, but while I'm using those CLI commands, what you need to know is that the CLI is actually a really, really thin wrapper around the API client, and that everything I do here today can also be done via curl. In fact, there's an interactive exercise. You all thought there'd be no work. There's an interactive exercise that we're gonna do together at the end, and that interactive exercise is going to involve using curl, or just not using curl and you can not participate and be rude, it's fine. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I need to do is I have this Vault server set up and I'll open source kind of this, this talk. So I said there's no slides, but I didn't say there's no materials. So I'm gonna open source basically everything that I say here. Um, so I have this workstation. What I have here is a, a cluster of Vault servers uh, and I have a Postgres database, which we'll talk about in a bit, and I have this workstation. And they're all in the same VPC on Amazon. Um, they're not in the Cape Town region because there is no such thing, so they're running in Ireland um, because AWS told me that that was the closest. So they're running in Ireland, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell my workstation how to connect to Vault. And the way I do that is I just tell it where Vault lives. And in this case, we do this via the environment variable, Vault Adder, and our Vault server happens to live at this really cool domain, which is vault.hashicorp.rocks. 
Uh, and it runs on uh, port 443, which is 443. So now I've set my vault adder, or vault address for short, and I can communicate with this vault server. So I can ask it for the status, for example. And I can see that even though Vault is running on a different server, I can query for its status or status. I don't know. What do you all say here? Status? Status? I heard six different things. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, so you can see here we're running Vault 062. Um, we have a cluster name and a cluster ID. Um, and this is a Vault server that's already unsealed, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's already running. It's ready to go. It's ready to receive secrets. So now what I need to do is authenticate to Vault. So anybody can ask the status of Vault, like is it running? That's an unauthenticated endpoint. But everything else in Vault requires some type of authorization. So I'm going to authorize as the root user, which I've conveniently named root. And now I'm the root user. So at this point, I can do anything in the system. This is super not a best practice. Uh, but this is super a best practice for a live demo. So I can do anything in the system. We'll talk about roles and policies in a little bit. But right now, I'm the root user, and I can do almost anything in the system. And I can still run vault status or status and get the result. You can see it's the same result. So the first thing vault can do is it can act as a static secret store. And this is where I recommend everyone get started, because it's the easiest thing to reason about. Vault can act as something like encrypted Redis or encrypted memcached. So what I'm about to do is going to feel not secure. Um, because it shouldn't have to be hard. We have this really bad mapping in our mind where security has to be hard, where if you base64 encode something because it's painful to you know, unbase64 encode something, which is called decoding, you, like it's, it's magically secure, but it, it's not. So we're going to use the Vault CLI, and again, this is just an API wrapper, and I'm going to put some data into this secret point. Everything in Vault is path-based. And that's actually how the, the roles and the permissions map as well. So secret slash is a path. And anything under that path gets delegated to the static secret storage backend, which again, it's just like encrypted Redis, encrypted key value store. So I'm going to name my secret foo, and I'm going to give it a value of bar equals 1. So everything is key value pairs. So I'll go ahead and save this. And you can see the data was written to this secret path. And it's important to note that this is written to the Vault server. It's stored right now in memory, but the Vault server has a number of ways that it can store or persist data. It's encrypted in transit and at rest. So you'll notice we're using the HTTPS endpoint. Um, so all of the communications via the API are running over TLS. And the Vault storage itself is encrypted um, in, in transit and at rest. Now I can ask for that secret back, secret slash foo. So if I ask for that secret back, you'll notice I get back this really nice table format. This is something that the CLI does for you that the API won't. It kind of prints things uh, in a nice tabular format for you. It gives us back this refresh interval, which is how long should uh, any client or human consuming this secret wait before checking if there's a new value. And then the value of bar equals 1. We can update these secrets, and we can have any number of key value pairs. So I'm going to update the value of bar to be banana, and I can update like the author field, which is just an arbitrary field, to be my username. And now, whenever I run that read command again, I'll get back you know, a refresh interval, the author, and um, bar equals banana. So internally, this is actually stored as JSON, and it's returned as JSON. The CLI is just parsing it out into a table for us. But all of the key value pairs that we write to this static secret backend are stored um, in the Vault server securely. <coughs> so what is, a, what is a use case here? Like, obviously, foo is not something that we would encrypt, and banana is not very secret. So why would you use the static secret backend? Well, the static secret backend is really good for secrets that don't change over time or can't be dynamically acquired. We'll talk about dynamic acquisition here in a minute. Static secrets are things like Wi-Fi passwords. Right? How many people have a guest network at their company or their office? Right? And you put the guest network password where? Or worse, you have a corporate network, and you're not using something like radius authentication, so you have one Wi-Fi password for everyone. And where do you put that? So static secrets are places where you put things like the Wi-Fi password. So you tell someone, hey, if you want the Wi-Fi password, you authenticate to Vault. And then you get the Wi-Fi password from secret slash Wi-Fi. And then you're not putting it on sticky notes all around the office, and you're not just handing it out to random people on business cards whenever they join your company. So those are some examples of static secrets. 
Another good use case for static secrets is data that is sensitive but not necessarily secret. So what's the difference between data that's sensitive versus secret? So if I were to ask you, is a password a secret, what would you say? Okay, we'll try this again. <laughs> is a password secret? Yes, exactly. Social security number or passport number? Email address. Phone number? Justin Bieber's phone number. Right, so the answer is it depends. Right, for some of these things it's straightforward, like a password or a credit card number, yeah, those are, those are easily secret. But is a phone number secret? Probably not. But it could be sensitive, right? It's personally identifiable information. Uh, and if that phone number happens to belong to, say, like, the President of the United States or a famous pop artist, it is probably a secret. So there's a, a gray line or a barrier there that isn't black and white. And this is where you can use the static secret backend to store this type of information. And this data is persisted over time, so this value will exist up until I destroy the Vault server. So it's safe to store persistent data in here. Uh, another use case for the static secret backend is things like one-off secrets. Like, oh, I need to get you a secret. Like, I need, I need to get Tom a secret. But I don't want to email Tom the secret because that, then it's in plain text and anyone can see it. Um, but Tom has access to Vault and I have access to Vault. And I could spend 45 minutes figuring out how to PGP encrypt it to email it to him. Or I could just put it in the Vault and say, hey, it lives at this path in the Vault. Go get it. And Tom has his own authentication of Vault. I have my own authentication of Vault. But since the secret backend is shared, we can use it to save 45 minutes and Googling to figure out how to do PGP encryption uh, just so we can email it back and forth. So those are static secrets. Not really exciting, um, and it doesn't feel super secure. Um, so like I can vault list secret, and I can see all of the keys in there. Um, I could do you know a, a full list if I wanted to, and I can even delete things. So I can vault delete secret foo, um, and now there are no secrets. Um, no more secrets, deleted the secret. So secret, the generic secret backend is just your static standard CRUD, create, read, update, delete, uh, with a list on there as well. So let's talk about dynamic secrets, because that wasn't really exciting. I'm not impressed. I don't know about you, but I'm not impressed. Um, I wrote some of this, which is why I'm not impressed. So how many people here run on AWS? OK, cool. That's like a fair number. What do the rest of you do? <laughs> GCP? Oh, cool. We have some GCP stuff. You're running on DigitalOcean full time? Good luck with that. Um, <clears throat> someone said Rackspace? Good luck with that too. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so we're going to use AWS as an example because one, I did it ahead of time, and two, a bunch of you raised your hand. So Vault has a notion of backends. I said secret backend before, but I didn't really explain what a backend is, and this is where things are going to converge. So everything in Vault is path based, and those paths map or route to a backend. <laughs> So if you're familiar with like a web app where you have a router which says like this path goes to this controller or this action or this function, that's exactly how Vault works as well. When you hit secret slash, it delegates to the generic or the static secret backend. And when I hit like slash foo, it would delegate to whatever backend I configured at slash foo. The secret backend was configured in advance because I didn't want to have to explain this all to you at the beginning. But now I'm going to explain it to you. And the way that you um, mount a backend is via the mount command. So these are very similar to like file system mounts. And what a mount does is it creates a new route. So it's going to create a mapping from whatever we give it to whatever backend we want to configure. So I'm going to spell vault wrong. Uh, I'm going to mount the AWS backend. So now what I've done is you can see the, the success message there is mounted AWS at AWS. So what this means is any path vault.hashicorp.rock slash AWS is going to delegate the rest of that payload to the backend. So Vault Core is actually very dumb. It is just a path router. It's the backends that actually have all of the responsibility and all of the processing. So you can think of a backend as like a plugin or a delegator. So Vault is going to look at that. It's going to say, ooh, AWS, and shove it off to the AWS backend. The AWS backend is then going to do whatever it does with that data. And then it'll return a result back, and then we'll see that on the CLI. So what does the AWS backend do? Well, the AWS backend provides us a way to programmatically generate 
IAM users or IAM credentials for accessing the Amazon API. Well, we have to kind of tell Vault how to do that, right? Like, which AWS do you want to talk to? Like, um, what are the credentials that I need to create the credentials, right? I need some type of super user that has permission to generate IAM credentials such that uh, I can actually tell Vault to generate them. So we have to give Vault configuration. And this is where people start to get a little bit weary because in general, we recommend giving Vault the root or very high privileged um, permissions in your system. So if it's a database, we recommend giving like the root user or creating a super user and giving those permissions to Vault. In the case of IAM credentials, we recommend creating a user that has like administrator access or at least administrator access over the IAM policies so that Vault can manage all of these things. And that makes people a bit unwary. But keep in mind that Vault has a full audit log, so any and all action is logged in the system. It's much better to give a computer root access so that if something happens, you have a full history of all of the things that that computer has done, as opposed to giving a human root access where that human can perform any operation, and if the back end doesn't support logging, you're not going to see it. So if Amazon didn't have IAM logging, you wouldn't even know which operations were performed. Um, so we're going to give Vault um, somewhat privileged AWS credentials. These are credentials that have um, admin permissions on basically all of IAM. Um, so we do this by writing to the AWS config endpoint, and we give it the standard, the standard three, what are the standard three? AWS access key, AWS secret access key, and the region. So I'm just gonna type for a second. So we say our access key equals, and we'll say our secret key equals, and we'll say our region equals, um, so what am I going to put in these for these values? Well, I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to tell you that I already populated environment variables with my access keys, so you all don't get to see them. How great is that? Um, it's like I've done this before. Uh, SEC, RET, key, and AWS, R-A-G-I-O-N. Cool, and now that configuration is written. Uh, and again, that, those configs were sent to Vault over TLS to the Vault server. Vault has stored them, encrypted, and this is how it's going to communicate with AWS. For other backends, you might just need one API key, right? It depends. So now we need to configure a lease. This is where Vault is different than other secret management solutions. When you create a credential in Vault, that credential behaves much more like a DHCP IP address than it does a, like a static secret or a string. Whenever I get an IP address from a DHCP server, it has a lease associated with it. It tells me, hey, this IP address is valid for eight days or six hours. And after that, you need to go back to the DHCP server and ask for a new IP address or you need to renew your existing one. If the renewal fails, the DHCP server will give you a new IP and says, hey, here's your new IP, refresh your network settings. Or it'll be like, yeah, you can continue using that IP address uh, until the end of time. This is IPv4. Let's not talk about IPv6. So that's how DHCP works. Vault works the same way. So we're going to ask Vault for IAM credentials. Vault's going to go out to Amazon, create those credentials, and return them to us. However, those credentials have a lifetime within Vault. And if after that lifetime, if you have not renewed the credential, if you have not said, hey, I'm still using those IAM credentials, Vault will revoke them. They'll be deleted. They'll get removed from Amazon. So you don't have these credentials that live forever and ever and ever. They live for a very short period of time. And the way you configure that amount of time is via the, the lease endpoint. So the default is 30 days, which is a really long time for a demo. So we're going to make it a little bit shorter um, by writing to AWS config lease. And we'll say that the lease is five minutes and the lease max is 24 hours. So what does that mean? What's the difference there? Well, the lease is the TTL. That's the minimum amount of time that the credential will be valid. So what this means is that if I generate an IAM credential, it'll live for five minutes on its own. If I'm using that IAM credential, whether it's in an application or as a human, I have to ping or update the Vault server saying, hey, I'm still using the credential within that five minute window. If not, it gets revoked. However, the maximum lifetime of that credential is 24 hours. So even if I continue pinging the Vault server and saying, hey, I'm still using the credential, hey, I'm still using the credential, after 24 hours, the Vault server is going to say, no, you cannot renew this. Here is a new credential. You need to reload your configure, whatever, because the maximum amount of time that that credential was allowed to live was 24 hours, and you've exceeded that maximum amount of time. So for those of you that have to be FIPS or HIPAA or some other three-letter acronym compliant, this is a checkbox that you have to have, which is how long do your credentials live at max? 
Um, and this is a checkbox that you can easily check with Vault that says, look, our credentials will never live longer than 60 days because that's the least maximum. So the last thing we need to do is we need to configure Vault with like how to create the IAM user. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Amazon, they have these things called policies. So we have to tell Vault whenever a user creates this thing, this is the policy that the IAM credential should have. And I'm just using a really simple example of a, a developer policy. So I have a, a policy here called policy.json. Um, and this is allowing any and all access to IAM. Um, if you don't know how to write these, Amazon has a really good policy editor uh, online, and it'll validate it for you. I promise I don't work for them. So we have to give Vault this policy, and this is the policy that it's going to attach to IAM users. So we do that by running Vault write uh, AWS roles. So we're going to create a role. I'm going to create this role called developer, uh, which is just the name of the role. That could be any arbitrary name. And I'm going to give it the policy. Uh, and I can use the at sign here, and Vault will read that file from disk. So I'll make this a little bit clearer. You could do you know, that. Um, but this is just reading a, a file from disk. So it's going to read that policy, upload it to the Vault server as JSON. The Vault server now has that data. Again, all of that transmission has been done over TLS. So if someone was snooping on this line, they wouldn't be able to read or uh, see that data. So now, hopefully, if I didn't mistype anything, what we can do is read from an endpoint. So we read from AWS creds with the name of the, the role, which is developer, and we'll get back, yes, we'll get back credentials. So this access key and this secret key are valid for talking to this particular Amazon account. Don't. Someone's thinking it, just don't. <laughs> You'll notice that they're valid for five minutes. That 5M0S is five minutes and zero seconds. That's how long this credential is valid. However, it's now valid for about four minutes and 38 seconds because I've been talking. And that timer is going to tick down until zero. And at zero, this will be deleted from the AWS console. So if I were to log into the AWS console right now, you'll see an IAM user that will be named like vault dash something. That's this IAM user. After five minutes, Vault will then make an API call out to AWS and say, yo, done with this credential, please to delete. And it will force delete that credential from AWS. Um, AWS at this time doesn't support the ability to say, like, I only want a credential valid for a period of time, to the best of my knowledge. So Vault can actually do that for you. It can give you that lifetime on an IAM credential. What you'll notice is that if I run that same command again, I'll get back a different IAM credential. They, they look a little bit the same because they both end in a Q and start with an AK, but if you look at the secret key, you'll notice they're completely different. Each time I read from this endpoint, I'm generating a new credential. So I've given a way for developers to programmatically access IAM credentials without needing to log into the CLI and without needing to use the AWS CLI or log into a web UI. They authenticate to Vault via whatever mechanism, LDAP, username and password, GitHub authentication. If they have the permissions, they can generate IAM credentials to then make AWS API calls. And I've configured the policy that they have attached. They can't change that. They can't give themselves higher permissions. So this here, these, these IAM credentials can only manage IAM. They can't do anything on EC2 because I didn't give them permission to do that in the policy. So this is an example of IAM or AWS. Let's take a look at something a little more within our data center, like Postgres. So I'm going to vault mount PostgreSQL. Same thing. It's going to mount the PostgreSQL backend. What the PostgreSQL backend does is it's going to generate username and password logins for the Postgres database. So instead of always logging in as the root user or having some hard-coded database username and password, we'll have the ability to dynamically generate them. So how do we do that? Well, we have to tell Vault how to connect to Postgres. So just like we gave Vault the access key and secret key to Amazon, we have to give it you know, a root user or a super user to Postgres, as well as the connection URL. Right? We could be using a remote database server or database as a service, or we could be using our own Postgres cluster. Vault doesn't care. It speaks generic Postgres. So we have to give it a connection URL. And this connection URL includes the username and password. So this is a username. This is a password. These were actually dynamically generated via Terraform, which is another tool that I'm not talking about today, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. This is the IP address of my Postgres server. I would use RDS, but it would still be provisioning. Um, some of you got that. Um, so I'm just using a standard like app-get install Postgres. 
Uh, so this is the connection URL, so I have to tell Vault that this is where I want to connect to Postgres. So post, PostgreSQL config connection, connection URL equals at connection URL.txt. Okay, and I get this warning back that says, hey, you wrote the credentials inside the connection URL. Um, so if anybody can read that endpoint back, then they'll get the connection URL back with the root username, so you need to add ACLs around that. The default ACLs are deny all, so this is actually just a little bit of a superfluous warning, um, but um, as the root user, I can read anything, but no other user in the system can read this unless I explicitly grant them permission to do so. So now I've given Vault the ability to talk to Postgres, and it actually validated the connection, so I know I typed it right. It made sure it can connect to Postgres. It actually did a very sample transaction to make sure it could create users and had permission to do so. So if I didn't generate the username correctly, it would have been like, you don't have permission to do the things I need to do. Next, we have to configure the lease again. So Vault write um, PostgreSQL config lease, lease equal five minutes, lease max equals 24 hours. So we'll go ahead and write that out. <coughs> Then, just like with IAM, we had to give it a policy. We have to give Vault the SQL we want it to run to create a Postgres user. Why can't Vault just create it for us? Well, do you want a read-only user? What tables do you want it to have access to? Should it be able to drop things? Should it be able to create other users? These are things that Vault doesn't know, so it's easier for you to just give us the SQL. And what we found is this, this makes DBAs really happy because they already have these commands and these transactions or these procedures that they're running, so we just get to codify them in something that can automate that process. Um, so I have this, this SQL that I wrote in advance. Doesn't look like SQL because there's these curly brace things in there. Drink break. Those things between the curly braces, that name, that password, that expiration, those get filled in by Vault. And you'll notice that there's a valid until clause in there. This is something that we can't do on Amazon yet, but when the backend supports it, we can have the backend revoke the credential even if Vault is offline. So if an attacker was able to launch a denial of service attack against our Vault cluster, Postgres would still revoke the credential for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and write this. So PostgreSQL roles, this is a read-only credential, because uh, you'll notice it has just select as the permission. Um, and the, the SQL, is read-only.sql. Okay, that data is written. And now, I should be able to read from PostgreSQL creds read-only. No, I spelled it wrong. That's an easy fix. And I'll get back a username and password. And if I run this again, I'll get back a different username and password. And these are actual database credentials. I could use this username and this password to log in to the database, or I could pass it off to an application. And this is important because now our applications can dynamically acquire their own database credentials. They authenticate the vault using their own metadata, like the AWS EC2 metadata API server, or maybe it's some embedded metadata in the image that you're launching. They authenticate the vault. Vault says, okay, you're allowed to access this. Here's your credential. That is unique to that machine and that app, and there is a full trace of provenance for any time that that application uses that secret. Again, they'll expire after five minutes unless we renew them. Uh, and applications are responsible for their own renewal life cycle. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so two more things. I have six minutes. So two more things. Um, as I said, everything is API driven. So I wanna generate those same API credentials without using the Vault CLI. Well, I can do that using this really great tool called curl. Um, and with the Vault CLI, it passes along authentication information for us, but with curl, we have to pass it along, and we do that via a XVault token header. So I'm gonna put a token in there in a second. Um, and then it's just vault.hashicorp.rocks, colon 443, um, v1, which is the API namespace, and then literally PostgreSQL creds read-only. So the exact same thing I typed on the CLI. Where do I get this vault token? Well, the vault CLI nicely stores it for us in this .vault-token directory. And you'll notice I get back a response pretty darn fast. I'll pipe this to JQ um, so that it's pretty. And you'll notice that this is the response. This is all via curl. I haven't used the Vault CLI. I'm just using strings. So you can see how this is very programmatic in the way it works. I don't need the Vault CLI. All I need is a library that can talk HTTP. And if it's, it's 2016, almost 2017, if you're using a language that doesn't have a built-in way to communicate to HTTP or HTTPS, I recommend rewriting in something that does. Um, 
or a plugin. I'm sure there's a plugin for it. So that's the API. So in the last like three minutes I have, we're going to do something fun. So if you have a mobile phone, you can do half of this. If you have a laptop, you can do the full thing. If you head on over to the internets and you actually go to vault.hashicorp.rocks forward slash app, so forward slash app, you'll see a page like this. If you click learn more, it'll take you to Vault's website. But if you click get Vault token, this is actually wired up to that Vault server. If you click get Vault token, it'll actually make an API request. It'll actually make an API request to Vault to generate you a token. This token is scoped to generate Postgres credentials, so you can try to generate IAM credentials with it, and you'll get a permission denied. This is your token, and then it actually gives you the copy and paste curl command that you can run to generate your own database credential. So I can do this. I'll copy this. I'll jump over. This is my, this is my normal laptop terminal. You can tell because it's blue. Uh, and I'll run this curl command, and I got permission denied. Damn it. Well, the live demo worked the whole time. Oh, I'm sad. Oh, wait, I know why it's not working. Aha. I didn't generate a policy. I forgot I crowdsource. Aha. Yes. OK. And now, from my local laptop, I can generate Postgres credentials uh, in a thing that's running behind a VPC that only has this one port 443 open and making API calls to Vault. Vault is then going within our VPC, talking to Postgres, generating the user, returning the result back to us programmatically. Um, and I can, I can do anything I want with this. So I can pull the, the data out and pass this along to any app that I want. Oh, it's limited to a certain number of uses. I think you get five before it, it deletes your token. That's all I have. Um, do I have questions? Are there any questions? I, th I don't I think, is there a mic? I can repeat the question. Uh, so the question is, like, would you host Vault yourself or would you use like a HashiCorp hosted solution? Um, we don't run Vault for you. Um, what we found is that, can't do this. what we found is that um, no one in their right mind would ever trust another company to run their secret management solution. Um, no one in their right mind. <laughs> <coughs> keyword, keyword. Um, so you run Vault yourself. It runs. Uh, here I'm not running in high availability mode, but there is a high availability mode where you can have failover, et cetera. Um, there's a bunch of stuff I didn't talk about, like um, the Shamir secret sharing algorithm, which uh, prevents one person from having complete access in the system. So you can have multiple people need to enter their keys in order to perform uh, root operations. Um, but usually you run Vault yourself. Um, we have a number of Terraform configs that'll spin it up for you on AWS, Google, DigitalOcean, Azure, um, kind of like get you, get you there and then you bootstrap and do whatever you want. Um, we don't, ha we don't do Vault as a service. Um, we don't run it for you, because like two people in the world would use it, and we would ask them why. <laughs> so, so the question is, can you replicate Vault data to a different cluster? Um, yes. In the next version of Vault, 0.7, will include replication of federation, um, but it's also going to be a paid feature. Um, can, how much can you customize the, say, the username, the actual username that you send back for potential further logging in a SIM system? Yeah, so uh, if you remember, uh, if you looked, like they were prefixed with token dash. So they're prefixed with whatever the authentication mechanism um, returns as the auth. So if you're logging in with the username and password mechanism, they'll be prefixed with user pass dash username dash whatever. Uh, if you're logging in with like GitHub, it'll be like gh dash your GitHub username dash whatever. So you can't customize it, but it is uh, predictable. So in, 
In terms of how sort of performant Vault is, um, have you guys got sort of set benchmark numbers in terms of the size of a cluster and how many nodes and how far you can push in terms of like transactions per second kind of thing? How can I say this? Um, I, don't, I don't have hard numbers. If you have engaged in a financial transaction in the past 24 hours, you have directly or indirectly interacted with Vault. Like I'll have, a, I'll have an idea ahead of time as to like how many credential requests I will be doing a second given the sort of stack that we run. So to then the first thing that comes to mind to me is well, what sort of size cluster and how it is size that and, and that kind of thing. Those considerations. Um, so it's written in Go, um, and if you're running in high availability mode, it'll like load balance across the clusters. And 0 0.7, the clusters can actually serve stale queries as well, so you've reduced the load on the leader. Um, you know, in terms of exact benchmarks, it depends on the, really it depends on the system that it's running on. If you're running on T2 micros, you're gonna have a really bad time. Um, I mean, if you're a small company, it'll work great, but if you're a big company where you're doing lots and lots of requests, it won't be great. Um, we don't have exact numbers because there's a number of things that affect it. Um, I will tell you that Vault is generally CPU intensive and not memory intensive because it's doing cryptography, so you wanna optimize for CPU heavy instances. Um, you know, in terms of performance, like, it's bounded by whatever you put it on. Um, so it can consume as much RAM and as much CPU as you're willing to give it. Um, you know, I can't talk about some of our customers, but I can say, like, I was walking around the room earlier and, like, people were typing things and, like, there were things that were going into Vault and I could see that happening over the internet. Um, like, there are some massive customers who are using Vault at incredibly large scale. We just can't talk about it. Because uh, the, the, the biggest part about your security defense is like not even knowing what you use for your security management. So there's a lot of companies that won't even say they use Vault just because that gives an attacker you know, insight into their system and their setup. It scales really well is the short answer. Other questions? What are the range of backends available? And is it possible to write your own backend for an internal auth requirement? Yeah, so the question is which backends are available and can I write my own? Um, all of the backends are listed on Vault's website, which is if you click on learn more, um, they're here. So under um, secret backends, um, that's the full list of built-ins. So AWS we used, Cassandra's pretty straightforward, console will generate an API token for communicating with console. Cubbyhole is um, what we use for response wrapping. Generic is what we used with the, the secret slash. MongoDB, MySQL, MSSQL, and Postgres are all databases. PKI is really interesting. A vault can actually replace your internal CA, so it'll generate certificates that can either be self-signed or signed with your own uh, root cert. Uh, RabbitMQ, um, SSH, vault can actually do SSH authentication, so it can wrap OpenSSH, uh, and you can log in without using public key, private key. It'll dynamically generate either a one-time password or a key that you log in, and then it revokes it the moment you actually access the system. Um, Transit, which is encryption as a service, this is most similar to like Amazon's KMS. Um, it just encrypts data for you, but it doesn't store it. It gives you back the encrypted data that you store on your own. And then custom, that last one should probably answer your question, which is yes, you can build your own. Um, you have to compile a vault from source if you build your own. Um, the reason for that is that uh, we're working on a cryptographically secure plugin system, but we can't just allow you to like throw random stuff in a vault because if it's in core, it has the ability to view things from core, um, which means it could like it could hijack something and like it could be malicious. So we have to have cryptographically signed plugins before we make it. Um, that you don't compile it into source, but you would compile your own plugin into source for now. But they're really easy to write. One more question. It should be from that half of the room because they're asleep. Um, in terms of key management, you obviously are running, what, what happens once the vault, let's say it's not running within a cluster, comes down, where is that key stored, the key encryption key? Is there such a thing, Dex, Kex, that whole outlook? Yeah, so I intentionally skipped over this because it's complex, but I'll show you. Um, uh, what did I call this thing? Vault 
Yeah, there it is. Open images. Shamir. Okay. So, this is the TLDR. There are two keys in Vault. This is the encryption key. Um, this thing is what actually encrypts the data in trans in, at rest on the system. So let's just say we're storing on disk for easy, but there's a number of storage mechanisms. This is what's going to encrypt the data on disk. The persistent data gets encrypted with this key. This master key here only ever exists in memory, and it encrypts the encryption key. It's a little meta. So the encryption key never exists in plain text either. The master key encrypts and decrypts it. The master key never actually exists. It's decomposed into a, number, a configurable number of key shares and key thresholds, such that a subset of those key shares have to come together to regenerate the master key. That master key can then be used to decrypt the encryption key. So Vault has this thing called a seal. This is the seal, in essence, which is if you take that master key, it gets generated and then broken apart into pieces. You give those pieces to people. Vault can't operate unless that master key exists in memory. Because if the master key doesn't exist, it can't actually decrypt the encryption key. So Vault can't access any of its own data. So this is where people, people talk about the seal and they immediately think, as a developer, you think like, if sealed equals equals false, like it, it doesn't work that way. Like Vault's architecture fundamentally doesn't allow it to operate if you don't have a threshold of those keys entered into the system. It's possible to rotate this and it's possible to rekey this. So they're both changeable. Um, so like, People rotate these every 30 days, and it maintains a key ring, so it'll upgrade them um, in time. This thing you rotate when someone adds or leaves the, the key shares list. So it's like if someone leaves the company that had a key share, you'll want to rekey uh, and redistribute the key shares. Or if um, you know this is configurable, so some companies have like 30 of these, and like 10 of them have to come together. Um, some companies have five of these, and all five of them have to come together. It's all configurable. Sorry. Okay. All right, I think that's all the time I have. Thank you very much. I'll be around the rest of today, so if you have any HashiCorp questions about any of the tools, please feel free to find me. Thank you.